Tape Projection. It's Wednesday morning, and you know what that means. It's time for another episode of the Alabama Slam Podcast. I'm your host, Corey Hanna. What's going on, guys? It's Patrick Akers. And uh, this is the first week in about a month that hasn't been a jam-packed sort of episode, right? Like, there's been some major shit popping off every week for the last few weeks. Um, So today we'll get to actually spend a little bit more time on the things we do have to talk about. I mean, I say it's not jam-packed. There were some cool things that have happened but we don't have a full page of notes like we've had lately. Yeah, there were so. no major deaths, thankfully. Yeah. Uh, there was no major firing of one Mr. CM Punk. So this was just kind of steady as it goes. Yeah, no for pay-per-views. Normal, normal week, no pay-per-views this week. Uh, so yeah, let's jump in. Uh, we'll start with uh, uh, last week. I, we'll do a different, because I've got, I've got Dynamite on here first. We'll do a different. Instead of doing WWE at the top, let's start off with Dynamite. Um Orange Cassidy comes out for a promo. Uh, you know, he hadn't been doing promos, and he did he did do a promo the week before that to end the show, right? Yeah. And uh, so he comes out basically, uh, like you said, we were talking before we started recording, basically as a fan acknowledgement. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe they actually give him a little bit of time off. I would. That's kind of what it seemed like. Like, hey, here's your last. Let the fans cheer for Orange Cassidy because... Uh, we somebody probably needs a vacation. Although John Moxley still has yet to get his vacation from <laughs> a year ago. From, yeah. So yeah, but uh, yeah, this was just a way for the fans to kind of acknowledge the the amazing work that Orange Cassidy's done with this international title. Yeah, I love you know I'm Orange Cassidy and I don't have a catchphrase. I mean, simple. They put it on a t-shirt. <laughs> you yeah. know, great stuff. I love it. It's good stuff. Um, you know. It gives a little bit more to it's like a, his character is, you know, they it's been a slow, slow build and it's been fun to watch because, like, the first couple months we saw him on TV, he was just play slapping people or play kicking people, you know, and then he had his first match yeah. with Pac and then it, it built and built and built from there. And uh, I think it's been fun to watch. Yeah, I mean, he leaned heavily on the comedy at the very beginning, even that match he referenced against Pac, like. They did that spot where he rolled and then Pac moved and then he rolled to the turnbuckle and he even like broke character there for a little bit, you know, when Pac was looking at him. But now he is, you know, to go from that to where he is, was at at All Out where he's completely bloodied, <laughs> getting the shit bit out of him. That's yeah. a hell of a character arc. And had one of our favorite matches of last year with Will Ospreay. Yeah, great matches throughout this whole entire title defense that he had. Yeah. 30 something defenses. Like, that's. It's a lot. That's a lot. And w- every fucking week, pretty much, right? Yeah. I mean, you he was the real workhorse. I mean, there are two guys in AEW that kind of, you know, if you look at their usage rates, Orange Cassidy and Darby Allen are kind of the two guys that are on there uh, pretty much every single week. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff there. And, you know, we've, we've been Orange Cassidy fans since the get go. So, um, it, you know, it'd be nice for him to get a little time off, and I'm sure he'll appreciate that. Um, next up for the notes, I've got the MJF promo where he was interrupted by Samoa Joe. And this is this is going to be fun. I think we kind of talked about it last week with, you know, them doing the throwback to Samoa Joe pushing MJF in the hallway at NXT. And, yeah. Um, you know, this could be a fight for MJF. You know, one thing that I was a little bit surprised about this promo was, first of all, there's a lot of inside references, or not inside references, a lot of WWE references outright, which I can't have anticipated. Um, And maybe we'll see this going forward. I thought MJF would be a little bit more, scared's not the right word, but maybe doubtful. I mean, this is a guy. I mean, yeah, he's he's gone up against the likes of John Moxley and and those kind of guys. But he did that as a heel, right? A chicken shit heel who knew he was going to skirt the rules to kind of get get a win. And now, as he has kind of turned over this new leaf, I mean, Samoa Joe is a he's a legendary wrestler, uh, and AEW has presented him like a final boss of sorts for a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, and. You know, he's getting up there in age, but he still don't fuck around. No, and so I thought this the MJF thing would be a little bit less comedic. You know, he called him like 
Pillsbury Joe Boy or whatever the hell he called the little the little grade school insults they kind of traded yeah. back and forth. Uh, not to say I didn't like it, and I'm gonna love this promo between or this feud between these two guys, but I just thought this was an opportunity to kind of you know sow a little bit of seeds of doubt with MJF. Um, but then they you know they had to pull apart and the you know Samoa Joe gets him with the neck injury, and you have Adam Cole coming out at the end. Uh, which was a nice touch. You know, he laid MJF out. MJF had to be helped to the back again for the second time within a week. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we'll see what happens. Obviously, they're kind of setting up two stories here at once because you have Samoa Joe. This is jumping forward a little bit. You got Samoa Joe and Roderick Strong, who are now going to face each other to see who gets to face MJF at Grand Slam. Um, I mean, it's obviously going to be... Smoke with Joe at this point, right? I think it will probably be Joe, and I think Roddy might face Adam Cole. I think that's probably the way they go about it. Uh, and we'll talk about Roderick Strong here when we talk about uh, some of his some of his matches because the character work has just just been brilliant from a lot of different people in AEW. Um, but yeah, it, it, you know, it all any kind of promo needs to do is just make you excited to see these two dudes wrestle, and I mean it did that. Um, Wednesday night. So that's all you can really ask for. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's going to be a fun one. They, they've done a good job of, of building up matches lately. I feel like, uh, and that's exciting. Um, so next up, which was a, a little bit of a surprise for me. Um, <laughs> I've got hangman, uh, has, does a promo. Hangman's doing a promo and he's interrupted by swerve. And I was like, this could be fire. And then my, my other note was, wait, what's happening? So it just started popping off and like, you know, it got a little weird there for a minute. And I, this is this is going to be an interesting storyline, I think. Yeah, it makes me really excited to see these two dudes wrestle. Um, it kind of makes me wonder, though, if they aren't. It, it felt like a little bit of a recycle of a story we've already told with Hangman Page. You know, Hangman's entire ascent to the top of the card was all about... Uh, him being doubtful of himself and, you know, finally overcoming that and realizing he is one of the top stars. He is one of the top wrestlers in the company. This kind of felt similar, although Swerve's coming at it from a different angle where he's like, you know, he, he had the line, like, you're not hungry anymore, something to that effect. Um, He even body shamed him a little bit, which I was like, oh, that's good. He even called that stuff like you haven't gotten any new gear in over a year. You know, you've been eating good and it looks like it. Uh, cool little digs like that. Um, and Swerve is right. Swerve is a guy who, he was one of the dudes on the short list who we talked about, okay, now that CM Punk is gone, who can they boot up to kind of go to the main top of the card? And I think he was first on both of our lists as a guy that we're really excited to see some screen time with. Yeah, probably him and Jay White or, or Danielson were the ones, I think, you know, we probably threw around last week. Yeah, and I mean, we got Danielson uh, this week in AEW too, but... um. It's a good spot for Swerve because I think he can he can beat Hangman Page in this feud and it makes sense for everybody involved. Like he can cheat to win and beat Hangman. And then with Hangman taking a loss, you know, he can kind of go back to the drawing board and now you can tell that story of here he is regaining his fire again, regaining that passion. Cause Swerve kind of punked him Wednesday and he kind of was just like, I'm kind of done and like started walking. And then Brian Cage obviously, you know, blindsided him. Um, so this is a good spot for both of these guys. Uh, it makes for a good story. And still, I mean, there is nobody like Swerve in all of wrestling. The look, the presentation, the presentation alone of that guy. Yeah. The ring gear, everything is cool. One thing about Hangman is like whenever he needs to show out, he shows out. Right? Like in yeah. his, what was it? The Texas death match with Lance Archer. And these when sometimes when there's a bigger spotlight put on him, is when he steps up the most in terms of his in ring. Like he's got great matches and I love, I'm a hangman fan, but when he needs to show out, he does. And I feel like this one is going to be one. If they keep hyping it when it comes to payoff time, like he's probably going to show out. And this is probably something they do at wrestle dream. Cause it's in Swerve's backyard and in, in Washington, uh, it's a, it'll be a big win for him. He'll feel like a star walking into that place. Cause it's his hometown. And like I said, Hangman is is accomplished enough and protected enough where he can eat a loss and still come back from it. Right. So and uh, put do a good job of putting Swerve over. 
Yeah, because Swerve needs to be he he needs a, a solid win against a top guy to cement himself into the 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 main event scene in AEW. And you know he's a dude who a year from now, two years from now, you could absolutely see him winning the AEW World Title. Yeah, and that was a, one of the points he made was if he had been given all the opportunities that Hangman had, he would be the first African American champion of AEW. And Hangman got a lot. I mean, he's not wrong. Hangman got a ton of opportunities, right? So Tag I mean, team champ early. The entire basically first two years of the company was kind of like Hangman's. It was really Hangman's story. It was his arc to get to the top. He was kind of the main character of AEW. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's move on to uh, one of your current favorite uh, stories, storylines or characters uh, is Tony Storm. And we we were talking about character work just before we started. Um, You know, character work is a thing that a lot of people say that AEW doesn't do a lot of, but that, you know, we got Tony Storm right now, stepping it up. You mentioned Roderick Strong. Uh, Juice Robinson. Yeah. Interesting character. So AEW, you know, has had, first of all, when you think of character work in, in AEW, probably Orange Cassidy comes to mind first. And he has killed it throughout the entire time he's been in AEW. But here recently, I don't know what's changed. I don't know if somebody's gotten a Tony Khan's ear. I don't know if there's a change in creative. You know, there's been talk. Maybe Brian Danielson's more involved. Maybe some other people have their hands. Again, wrestling is, is, is it's simple. If you take really, really stupid things and you treat them very, very seriously, they will get over. So Roderick Strong has this neck brace. They've even gone so far as to change his match graphic to where he looks like a damn, uh, you know, he's got the glasses and the button up shirt and the neck brace. And he looks like he's just pissed off at the world. Uh, And he wears the neck brace out to the ring. Uh, The guys in the kingdom have T-shirts that say neck strong. Perfect, right? <laughs> we talked about the character work of Juice Robinson, how basically he's just, he's nothing more than like an, a coked up 80s wrestler, right? He's Ultimate Warrior without all the fucking tang, you know, whatever tassels. Yeah. And, and a lot more cooler. Um, and then you look at Tony Storm. This is the most interesting Tony Storm has ever been in her entire career. And she's a two time AEW's world champion. Um, she has always been fantastic in the ring, you know. I think sort of the disconnect with f- f- she look she's she has had a little bit of a disconnect with the fans, even when she was the champion, right? She never felt like she was the biggest deal in that women's division, right? There were always people. Britt Baker overshadowed her. Soraya came in. Soraya came in. It was all these people, right? And again, she's she has done something so simple, and they've told this story so beautifully over these past couple weeks, even though it's not got that much screen time. You know, her backstage interview with Renee is just, it's a master class of like, here's how you get characters over. And she's doing something that we really, you know, we've seen in movies before. Like she's basically just doing Sunset Boulevard, but she's doing it in professional wrestling. <laughs> and I haven't checked AEW shop now or today, but I guarantee you at some point pretty soon, there will be a t-shirt. This is chin up, tits out, and watch for the shoe. Yeah. And it will, women will buy it. Yeah. Cause at first I was like, what is she talking about? Watch for the shoe. And she walked off. And then all of a sudden, this fucking shoe comes flying back in. Yeah. Brilliant. It makes it great. Like, I mean, like we talked about, you know, doing the cool moves in the ring will only get you so far. It just will. Like, it, it, it hits a threshold. We're like, everybody's doing cool moves. Yeah. So what can you do to separate yourself? And it's the character work. It's the little, little, little tiny things. Because this character has really evolved. She really, you know, at first it was just kind of like, she changed her hair, right? Then she changed her gear. Then she went to the whole. I mean, she's just wearing lingerie backstage. Yeah. Then it's like, then it goes into all of that. And she, she starts barring from Sunset Boulevard and she starts throwing the shoe. And then it becomes, now it's a whole thing. And now if you keep doing it, like, here's the thing that, you know, credit to AEW, too. They've given this thing consistent screen time. Not a lot of screen time, but she's consistently. You only need a couple minutes. You only need a couple minutes. And she's consistently been on TV with this gimmick, and that's what gets it over. Well, it was a, they kind of teased it last week where, was it Soraya says she was outside throwing her shoe at pigeons or something like yeah, that? Yeah, and then you get other characters that start talking about it. And then it becomes a whole thing. And then she comes out at All Out, and she climbs out from, you know, crawls under the ring. 
goes the complete wrong way, first of all, which was just absolutely fantastic. Backtracks, get the spray can, and, you know, of course she doesn't remember it. Uh, but, yeah, it's it's fantastic stuff. And, again, it, it's dumb things treated seriously and taken seriously. They get they get over. Yeah, good stuff happening there. You know. It's like the card blade. Yeah, card blade is one of the greatest things happening it's right It's just, now. you know, you keep doing it. If you keep doing it. It becomes a thing. I looked to see if they had the mini card blades on sale on the shop AEW the other day, and they didn't. Oh, boy. That was WWE. They'd be all over it. You could buy six different sizes of card, card blade if it yeah. was WWE. Yeah. Well, but, yeah, that was every every little thing. Like, you know, a lot of people, for a lot of people, AEW is not their cup of tea. And I get it. You know, it is heavily focused on the work rate. And some people, you know, a lot of people do want, more storytelling when they're wrestling, but you also have to acknowledge when a company is trying to pivot and go in a different direction. Uh, and so, you know, if you haven't watched Dynamite, you haven't watched Collision, like I would say, give it a, at least give Dynamite a shot now. Who knows what Collision's going to be now with the absence of CM Punk? Yeah. This week's episode, which we'll get to, was kind of eh. But I feel like it was probably more of a the reset before the reset, right? Because they were, they had just come off two big pay per views. They fired Punk. They probably had a big show planned, and then they were like, "You know what? Fuck it. Yeah, we don't have to put on a heater this week. We're going up against Bama in Texas. Yeah, college football's back. Yeah, you know there was probably I'm sure there was another big game on, but you know I watched Bama in Texas that night and looked at Collision the next day, mostly in fast forward mode because I was like, eh, this is whatever. This Colorado is, is a big draw now in college football. Yeah. They have a primetime game next Saturday. Yeah. So yeah, it's going to, Collision's going to be tough. That's going to be a tough time slot for them. Um, so we will see if, you know, I don't know how these ratings things work. I mean, I watch it through DVR. I never watch any of the stuff live anyway. Yeah, I have no clue. So um, the last thing I've got for Dynamite is Darby Allen versus Nick Wayne and uh, Darby gets the win. You know, they show respect at the beginning. Um, they're both obviously good friends, but they got put up against each other in this tournament. Um, Nick Wayne gets in a lot of work, and, I, you know, they're. it looks like they're not afraid to just throw him to the wolves right now. Well, like we've talked about, he's by far the most accomplished 19-year-old or 20-year-old, however old he is, uh, in wrestling history. I mean, this guy's been all over the world been doing it at the top level indies for a while now yeah and still going at it with uh east west express and gcw on yeah the weekends. he's still taking other kind of booking so uh you know the moments never look too big for him and that's all you can really ask for from somebody his age uh, and he'll continually get better i mean his selling has improved since he's been in AEW, which is what you can you know that's one of the main things you need as a baby face that ability to to sell, to draw people into a match. They tease this a little bit, and I think it's a good move. I'm just way more intrigued by Nick Wayne if he joins up with Christian Cage. Yeah, they did kind of go go to that again, like with he with him talking about his dad backstage. Because or him being 19 and him being a white meat baby face is so on the nose obvious that what can you do to make this to help this dude out? Put him with Christian Cage. Make him a heel. Like he doesn't have really the body for it, really. But if he's going up against guys like Darby Allen, that's not really that much physical difference between the two guys, right? It's not like he's trying to beat up on fucking uh, Wardlow, you know, as a heel. So you can give him guys that he can beat up. Um, and, you, of course, you have Luchasaurus by his side with the Christian Cage stable. Uh, you know, here's the thing. If you have... I don't know... We don't know how... Buddy Wayne would have felt about this, but if he's going to join up with Nick K with Christian Cage, the first thing Nick Wayne has to say is, "My father was a loser jobber, and I just and I wanted to find another father figure who's an actual champion." Now, whether he would actually say something like that on TV, I don't know. It is pro wrestling, and so if Buddy Wayne was, you know, any kind of heat is good heat, you know, maybe he was that. I would, you know, if I would like, I wouldn't care if my son was a wrestler, and you know. I died, and he talked shit about me to to get some heat. It was just a, par for the course, you know. I sent you the screenshot the other day. It was like uh, on this day, however many years ago, Edge defeated Buddy Wayne, and somebody had, yeah. had, had like screenshotted it and was like, "Uh oh, Christian Cage has seen this." <laughs> yeah. So, um, 
you know, Nick pairing up with Christian Cage, it automatically makes him way more interesting. Um, it lets him and Darby have a, a little bit of a feud that's kind of meaningful, right? And then you can have Darby, he's got his allies in his corner with AR Fox and the like. So you can you can make a cool little little multi-man match with that. Um, and with Darby, like, listen, I obviously have not watched all of wrestling history. You know, I'm only 32 years old. So there might be somebody, some listener might be, you know, hear, hear what I'm about to say and be like, no, this guy went harder. I don't know if there's a dude in wrestling history on a week to week basis who has gone harder inside the ring than Darby Allen. No. I mean, I'm just saying and that I, just, and, just because, but like, no. And personally, I don't even think it's close. Like, he is the Michael Jordan of week to week. I'm going to take a crazy bump. He took two this week. He reminds me of this dude that I knew in growing up in elementary school named Greg Bracken. Greg was like all in. Like we were playing hoops on a little bitty in his driveway on just a little bitty goal like that was maybe four foot high, you know, like little. Yeah. And he had this like six foot drop off off the edge of his driveway, right? That went into his yard. And his yard was at like a 75 degree angle. Just straight. Just 50 yards down, <laughs> right? And this motherfucker would dive clean off of it trying to get a ball. I was like, bro. Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. It ain't that serious. We're just right here playing one-on-one. Yeah. But he was all in. If he was he was playing, he was going hard. Some people are just wired like that, man. And this dude, I mean, so the, the, the two spots I'm talking about, obviously the one in this match with Nick Wayne, he goes to do his patented dive. Nick Wayne just moves out of the way, Samoa Joe esque, like, and Darby just hits the guardrail. <laughs> uh, and then the one in his match against Roderick Strong, he takes the backbreaker on the turnbuckle, flips off, and just flips on his neck, shoulder right there on the ring apron, and falls over. Like, he just, it's 112 miles an hour every single time this dude's on TV. And I admire the hell out of it. But like I said, my man's is here for a good time, but not a long time. He. Bro, you can't you can't do this. You going to die when you're 38. It just, you can't take bumps like this. I now appreciate the hell out of it. Um, it's going to be interesting to see if he can evolve once he does start getting minor injuries that start adding up. What is my dog chewing on? He got something going on over here. But um, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, because a lot of people evolve and change their style as they get older and as they get different injuries that affect the way they do certain things. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how Darby evolves. But, you know, the biggest question there would be, is he going to evolve so much that he then takes away what makes him special? You know, bring it back to NFL football. A lot of people are like... Hey, Josh Allen uh, doesn't need to try to run over middle linebackers for a six-yard gain. You know, he's a quarterback slide. But the dude's been doing that since yeah. he's been playing football. Got that dog in him. He, he got a dog in him. Like, you can't ask people. Sometimes this is just who people are, you know? Uh, and so, yeah, we'll, we'll see if Darby can evolve and, and change like you said. But for right now, I mean, damn, the dude is just balls to the wall nonstop. And again, like, he's on every show. Yeah. He was on Dynamite and Collision this week doing crazy ass bumps. You know, he'll be probably on Dynamite and Collision next week. You know, he is a huge part of the show going every single week. So, random question. Are they still doing house shows now that they have Collision? No, they're not. So they just said, no. Yeah, that was only like a, a two month thing, yeah. something like that. It was really, really short. But he was even that. on the fucking house shows. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's what made me think about it. Yeah. It's like Huntsville had a house show and fucking Darby Allen was there. Yeah, I think it was Darby and Juice. I think is what it was. Um, yeah, it's just, it's wild. I mean, I admire the hell out of it. And at the same time, I, I worry to death about this dude's health. But, you know, what can you do? <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. I mean, my dog is, he doesn't ever eat shit. And he's just over there eating something. So he got a bone or something? <sighs> no. Oh well. Oh well. He, he made something a bone. Well, all right. Um, let's get into some collision notes. Uh, you know, like I mentioned, I fast forward through it through it um, Saturday, Sunday morning because I watched the Bama Texas game uh, Saturday night. So 
nothing really caught my eyes. The thing that was like, hey, I got to stop and watch this. But Jade Cargill is back. Obviously, she's going to want her title back, I guess, right? Do you think they put it on her or they let, let Chris run with it for a little No, while? I think they'll keep giving it to Chris. The thing about Jade Cargill is like, where does she go now? Because the whole thing about her was she was undefeated, right? That was her stick. I mean, she still looks like a fucking million dollars. She looks like a superstar more than anybody else in AEW looks like a superstar. Yeah. Uh, it just, as soon as... She's not there in the ring yet. No, but I mean, as soon as she pops up on camera, you're like, oh yeah, you could convince me she's a mainstream crossover star. Like, she could be in... I just fucking saw an Expendables trailer. I guess they're making another one. They've made another one of those movies that's coming out. You could convince me that if you told me like, hey, Jade Cargill's in the Expendables, I'd be like, oh yeah, she looks like she fits. Like she's got that kind of appeal that in a way that not a lot of people in wrestling do. Yeah. Um, but again, it's like, what do you do with her? Where does she go? Um, you know, I've said for the longest she needs to join the Outcast. She should be their top draft pick. And maybe they do. You know, now, now that Tony Storm, if she keeps getting more babyface pops, then... You know, you got to think they kind of have to separate her from that group, right? Well, who do they go out and get? Well, you could get a Jade Cargill that could slide into that role. Um, but yeah, it's good to see her back. It's just like with any wrestler, what what happens next? Yeah. And if she's improved in the ring. I mean, she was constantly getting better. Her Chris Statlander match was probably the best match she's ever had in AEW. And now she's had some more time here and... I'm you sure know, she's been working, so she we'll took see. some time off. Yeah, but she, I'm sure she trained as well. Like, yeah, there's probably, you know, some a reason why she took that extended time off. I mean, I don't know, yeah. but I'm just talking out of my ass here. She still looks like a star, though. Yeah. Was there anything else that we were we were going to talk about? We don't have any. Yeah, you had Danielson come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the 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 thing making the the rounds in the dirt sheets is that. You know, he he said he was going to have a match at Wrestle Dream with Zack Saber Jr., yeah. uh, the quote unquote greatest technical wrestler in the in the world. Um, and I, I feel like he's going to spend this last year. He's talking about this is going to be his last year full time in the ring because he promised his daughter he would, you know, retire quote unquote retire um, when he reached a, when she reached a certain age. So yeah, but now it's making the rounds that he will probably not be involved as a wrestler full time, but he will still have big matches here and there and he'll be involved behind the scenes. He and Tony Khan are apparently pretty tight. Yeah. And it's kind of looking like he's going to be the one in, in charge of collision. It's not a bad person to give the reins over to. Um, you know, yeah, he has, he is amping up. This is his last year. You know, he hasn't won the AEW title yet. Uh, a lot of people thought he should have won it, what was it, last year's Grand Slam? Him and Moxley? Just because, like, Brian is such a big star in wrestling that to have him win the title elevates the title just for the fact that, you know, this is a dude who is one of the biggest stars in the other company. Um I'm not so sure that I wouldn't have play out a situation where he doesn't end up winning the AEW world title and kind of holds it for a whole year and like threatens to retire with it. And is like, somebody has to beat me. And then you build up somebody who obviously dethrones him, you know, at the end of his year. But like before he leaves AEW, that man has to have the AEW world title around his waist at some point. We, we can't have his whole career go through and he never wins that title. I hadn't really thought about it that way because I, I kind of looked at it like he's just going to spend the year having dream matches. But he said in this promo in collision, this is going to be the most epic year of my career. Okay. Now, this is a dude who has main event in WrestleMania and won. This is a dude who has put on five-star classic after five-star classic. Epic year to me would be to try to do something that has never been done in the history of wrestling, and that is, I'm going to retire as the world champion. Nobody's going to beat me for this thing. And then you, you know, his whole thing is about competition. You let him beat some people, and then, like, you know, at month 12, whatever pay-per-view that is, two days before he's set to retire or whatever, he gets the match, and you build up. You know, that's where that's where maybe a babyface Ricky Starks could beat him. 
and win the title. That's when maybe an Eddie Kingston could beat him and win the title. Yeah, because you notice he, like he, he did make it a point to say the other night that he saw the fight. And he even offered Ricky Starks a spot in the Blackpool Combat Club yeah. based on his performance during the strap match. Yeah. I, if I was just Tony Khan, I would be like, listen, I, you know, if Brian has not wanted the belt before, I'd be like, you know, we only, if we only got a year of you left, you got to have this thing. Like, I know you don't want to take it, but you got to take it and we'll build it up. And you build him up as like this, you know, I'm the I'm already the goat. People call me the goat. So what's the goat thing to do is to walk out like fucking, you know, whoever. I was trying to, I was going to say Tom Brady, but Tom Brady didn't walk out. Tom Brady should have retired after he won the Super Bowl with the Bucks. But to walk out like that and just be like, I'm going to walk out as champion on my term. John Elway, I guess. There you go. Yeah. He did that. Yeah. Something like that. Uh, Don't go in for three plays and get your uh, Achilles torn. (laughs) R.I.P. R.I.P. Aaron Rodgers' Achilles. And horns up, by the way. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about that at the end of the podcast, yeah. I'm sure. Uh, so let's switch gears. Let's go to uh, WWE SmackDown from um, Friday. There was starts out, or not starts out, but uh, there was a promo battle with LA Knight and Austin Theory, and they had a match, and LA Knight gets the win. Still trying to figure out what they're doing with our man's Knight. I kind of have a little bit of a sneaking suspicion that it's going to be fucking Roman Reigns and LA Knight at the Royal Rumble for the world uni- for the Universal Title. Or because why else do you put him in that backstage segment with Paul Heyman? Ooh, like we've talked about, and he made it a point to be like, "Yeah, I've never met you before." Because listen, if if we think if they're gonna do what we all think they're gonna do, and at Survivor Series there's some kind of like four way match with Solo and Jimmy and Jay and Roman all for the title, and it's gonna be Cody at WrestleMania against Roman. Royal Rumble is still a huge pay-per-view. You're not going to have Roman in the Rumble at all. So, why not let LA Knight take a crack and have a little mini program with Roman Reigns and just let them main event or or let them do the Royal Rumble? I don't and That's pretty good. Because we all think it's going to be Cody anyway, right? That wins the Rumble. Right. I mean, all signs are pointing toward that. Even if he doesn't win the Rumble, somehow, some way. It's going to be Roman and Cody next year's WrestleMania. Yeah. Then you could have you have LA Knight go up against Roman Reigns. Then you could easily just have Roman or not Roman LA Knight beat whoever for Intercontinental Title or United States Title. He could still do that at WrestleMania. At WrestleMania. And we'll get we'll get to yeah that in a minute the Intercontinental Title. But yeah, that's hmm. Hadn't really thought about that. It still seems like they're just trying to figure it out. I, they say they they've got the plans in place, but you know, there's also things coming out today that Vince was back last night changing shit two hours before the show. Well, listen, if he can't hear the crowd reaction every time damn L.A. Night pops off. Then I mean, just go ahead and fucking retire, bro. Which I guess he is already retired because. TKO or Endeavor slash TKO that that merger went through today, so he is now. This is the first time that WWE has not been owned by McMahon in some kind of capacity. Um, but yeah, I just think the, the reason that they've hesitated on LA Knight or what we have perceived to be a hesitation on LA Knight is just because they had way bigger plans for him and they were like, "Well, Roman needs somebody in January. Why fucking why not this guy? Because who else is it going to be?" Who else you put against Roman at Royal Rumble that makes it believable? You don't want to waste the Cody thing. You don't want to do that twice. No. You've already done Jay. What are you going to do solo? Like, eh. Is that is that going to main event a pay-per-view? Like, I don't know. But LA Knight and Roman Reigns makes a hell of a lot of sense. Yeah. Th- they got to do something. I mean, maybe they're just working on the slow burn. But... You got to strike while the iron is hot. I mean, shit. And that's why I like, you know, put put him up against the big dog. Big dog himself. But you might be onto something there. I'm kind of intrigued by an Austin Theory, Grayson Waller tag team, though. At least it gives the, both of them, go, those guys, something to do. What do they call it? A-Town Down Under? A-Town Down Under, like, you know. I don't know who they feud up against because... 
Judgment Day currently has the tag titles. And listen, is if you you're in the Huntsville or North Alabama area and you've ever been to a show at Stand Up Live, I am convinced that the pre-show music they play that don't but don't that's the same fucking song. This is just royalty free music that they're using for Austin Theory's walkout music. Oh, you think so? I think it's the same shit. Oh, I don't know. I haven't heard. I am 99% sure. I haven't been to a show uh, at Stand Up Live in about two years, but I'm fucking pretty sure. Well, you know, MJF's music is royalty free. We found out the Hardy's music was royalty free, (laughs) too. So, like, hell, I don't know. Maybe. (laughs) Maybe. Shit. There's a lot of royalty free music out there. (sighs) You know, who are you if you're not writing your own goddamn entrance music, Cody Rhodes? And that's why he is... The absolute best. Did you see there's a fucking TikTok going around? There's like Cody songs throughout the years and they've all got a fucking woe in them. I didn't see that. Yeah, oh, I should have sent it to you. I feel like I just bombard you with shit when I start drinking on the weekends. I'm like, Patrick ain't fucking responded to none of this. And I'm I, like, I know he sees it. Yeah. Sometimes like, I'm really bad about like seeing something and then just forgetting to respond yeah. to it. But there's a TikTok going around and it's Cody's themes throughout the years and they've all got a fucking Whoa. Not maybe not the same melodic whoa, but they've all got that whoa in there. He seems like the type of guy, cerebral guy, who would think about that and make sure that that's still in there yeah. and like would recognize that. Uh, the only thing I'll say about this LA Night segment, I love the the jab at Kevin Nash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. I, I of course did not pick up on it because I was not watching. I caught wrestling. it instantly, and I was like, "That's clever. That's that. That's a clever. You know." Because, hey, man, people keep giving this dude shit. He's a ripoff, whatever. Fucking the fans are eating it up. And isn't uh, I especially love it when it comes from, like, the old timers, like Kevin Nash. And I like Kevin Nash. I'm not taking too much of a dig at him. But, like, you hear old school wrestlers talk, and they're always like, it's all about selling tickets, all about moving merch, putting asses in seats. And then you got a guy like L.A. Knight that does all that, and then they're just like, well, he's just a ripoff. It's like, well, what the, okay, what do you want? Can't have it both ways. Yeah. Is it about being original and creative or is it about just moving merch and selling tickets? I did see a quote from Nick Khan today. And I guess somebody had asked him about it. He was like, he's the first of LA night. I was like, somebody step up and take care of this dude. Like protect your guy. He's selling shirts left and right. Every fucking sign you look at in the crowd says, yeah. Also though, the whole originality in wrestling is so fucking overrated. It's, I don't know. Everybody's ripping off everybody. Fucking Ric Flair, my favorite, wasn't even the first nature boy. Like, right. he wasn't even the only nature boy when he was fucking wrestling. So, I don't know. It's just, that's a stupid argument to have in this kind of art form like this. Yeah. True. Well, let's, uh, let's switch gears to, to Raw. I had another note from SmackDown, but I, I'd like to spend more time on the Raw stuff. Um, so last night, Raw starts off with the Jey Uso promo. KO comes out and interrupts him, and then the Judgment Day comes out and say, you know, they respect Jay. They're trying to get Jay Uso and the Judgment Day, and Sammy's not there last night, blah, blah, blah. So Jay tells KO that he'll team up with him uh, to earn his respect in a match versus the Judgment Day. So it's KO and Jay versus uh, Dom, not Dom, uh, Finn and Damien. Well, of course... Jay goes to do the super kick, accidentally gets KO. KO doesn't believe him. Yada, yada, yada. Um, I thought that was a pretty interesting angle to go with because, you know, KO was talking about, you know, I've wronged a lot of people and I've tried to make up for it and apologize. And they, some of them have accepted it and some of them won't, still don't talk to me. He was like, there's a lot of people back here that don't want to talk to you. Yeah. So I thought this was an interesting angle and a good way to kind of bring him into the fold of it, of everything on Raw. What do you think? Uh, I thought, yeah, I thought this was good. I had just had a funny little observation about Jay Uso after like after seeing Jay and Simi, seeing Jimmy split. Right. Jay Uso is like when your parents get divorced, but your mom gets to keep the house and keep all the shit and. You know, your dad just has to like go get an apartment somewhere and live <laughs> get, like a bachelor. Get a shitty fucking... apartment and see you on uh, Friday after five until Sunday at five. Yeah. Yeah. So Jay gets to keep the music. He gets to keep the cool, you know. Dyes his hair. He getting his hair did. We're in your city. 
And old Jimmy just gets like generic ass. Jimmy's sucking up to fucking his younger brother on the other show. Yeah. Like, look what I did. Yeah. Look and what the, I did. Like, you don't get to keep the music. The music's different. So, yeah. I mean, it's a... Uh, who won that divorce, I think, is pretty clear at this point. But, yeah. I mean, Jay is a star. Kevin's a star. Doll, this was great. Um, You know, they like we said, Raw feels like a more complete show now because all of the stars assigned to that show were there every single week. Jimmy, Kevin... Now this week's a little bit different because they had another they had a show going on in India, so it's like a little bit you know people trying to get back and all that kind of shit. Yeah, like um, and Becky couldn't even get over there because her passport was fucked up. Yeah, but Cena was there, right? Yeah, and we'll get Cena on SmackDown uh, next week or this week too. Um, this isn't much of a conspiracy theory, but I'm like ninety nine percent sure now. Maybe other listeners have noticed this and been like, "Yeah, dumbass." Of course, that's what they're doing. Uh, they're piping in crowd noise for Dominic now, mm-hmm. and they're killing his mic, hundred percent. I I started to mention that like a week or two ago, but last night it was just last night and Friday night was like, oh, you're not even trying to hide. Like we know what you're doing. Like it's TD Garden and Friday night is not that loud when the fucking Lakers are in town. Well, and he could he could. He could help cover up some of it because he takes that pause before he tar- starts talking. I'm like, just yeah. fucking start talking, dude. Yeah. Yeah. And you could even tell it because Finn tried to interject and his mic was low. So, there, I mean, smart play on WWE's part, but like, we caught you. Jig is up. Yeah. You know, Dominic is a heat machine, but he ain't, he ain't that. That's that's a different. That's some production. That's a different level helping him out. Um. But yeah, I'm I'm still intrigued by Judgment Day. I still think Judgment Day is great. Um, I'm still not a fan of Senior Money in the Bank. I just that will never sit right with me. That just seems cheesy as fuck. But it's fine. It's fine. That's WWE for you. That's what they do. It's like, oh, the dude's Hispanic. Why is he not Senior Money in the Bank? It's like I don't know because maybe that's fucking stupid. <laughs> we shouldn't do that, you know. Yeah. But uh, whatever. That's neither here nor there. Yeah, I don't know. It, I mean, whatever. It I is just, what it is. I just want to know what they do with that briefcase at this point. He has to. It has to cash in at some point on Seth Rollins in the World Heavyweight Title. Yeah, because what else is he going to cash in? It's on? not going to lead to him and Roman at any. Roman is on his own course, doing his own thing. But did they let him win over Seth? Well, see, that's instead the thing. of somebody like Shinsuke. Yeah, I mean, it it has to be when he when he cashes in. It's going to have to be the moment of crisis for the judgment day where they like full on break up where like Finn screws him or JD McDonough or somebody, something happens. Yeah. I mean, Shinsuke still getting them fire pre tapes. Cause the one from last night was fucking great. Yeah. They've still been treating him like a big deal, which uh, I'm not mad at. I mean, With I like samurai the sword and shit. Yeah. And so I guess they'll, they'll run that back at what's the next pay-per-view. The race car one, whatever the fuck that one is. Fast fast lane, whatever yeah. the fuck. Yeah. That has to be the the paper you the the main event for that one. Hmm. Gonna be interesting. Let's spend a little bit of time. We got, you know, quite a bit of time left, but uh last night was Gunther's Gunther's celebration uh for having, you know, the longest reign in the Intercontinental Championship history. Um you know, they got some props on stage, et cetera, et cetera. He's giving his speech. And then, shoosh, Chad Gable comes out. So part of me was like, okay, I saw this coming because they're like, they could have a rubber match. You know, right now it's one-on-one. Um, but then Chad, Chad came out and gave a little fire promo. Like, you know, he's had more of a comedic thing the last few months or whatever, but like he was pretty fired up last night you know talking about his family his family was there his daughter was crying etc cetera, etc cetera. um you know i i feel like and we talked about this quite for just a second before we started but like i feel like when it finally comes off gunther it'll probably go on chad it's like with any anytime you have a long reigning champion Whoever they lose to, like when they lose, it should be to make a new star. Like that is the way you elevate somebody up. So like it doesn't make sense for Gunther to lose to like a Bobby Lashley. You know what I mean? Because Bobby's already established. 
And like we talked about with Chad Gable, first of all, he's absolutely top tier in the ring. I mean, his his work rate is, especially for WWE, is outstanding. But he also has just like the real life pedigree of being an Olympic level wrestler. So anytime you wanted to change his gimmick just a little bit, like you can just remind people like, oh yeah, this dude was in the Olympics. Like he's a badass. <laughs> and he instantly makes it to where like, yeah. Yeah, I could see this dude beating Gunther, like with that kind of pedigree that he has back there. But um, now he's got that fire, right? With well, the yeah. family thing and feeling like he got, he didn't say it, but it's like almost like feeling like he got disrespected. Yeah. And it, listen, I mean, it's so simple. Anytime you put somebody's family on screen, right? Especially for a baby face, it makes them immediately sympathetic. I mean, just from the get go. Uh, so, yeah, I don't, I would pull the trigger on this. I don't know when I would pull the trigger on it. Um, but yeah, Chad Gable should be in, he should be Gunther for the Intercontinental title. Like we said, that, that title, if it's going to, if Gunther has elevated it to a meaningful position in WWE, and I think he has. Yeah. I mean, Gunther, Gunther competes with the big dogs. I mean, he's literally the longest reigning Intercontinental champion of, of all time, right? Yeah. Cause what else do you do with him? Yeah. You can't just have him keep beating people. He has to lose to someone to help make them a star. And that's the true, you know, like we talked about Roman Reigns. The, the true mark of any kind of like superstar top, top tier guy in a wrestling company is, can you help make other stars? You know, Ric Flair did it for Sting. Ric Flair did it for Steamboat. Like, that's the true test of if you're a, a top guy in a company is to help elevate people uh, around you. Uh, I think he's done that with the Chad Gable feud and Gable's done himself a lot of favors too, with like you said, his, his fire and his promos and just his ability to wrestle in the ring. Um, but now it's the time to, to put a title on him. I think. Yeah. Do you think they hold off on it for a little bit, like build to it? Or do you think they go ahead and do it next month at the pay-per-view? Well, like each pay-per-view, even these like small ones have had moments, right? Like, you know, the last one was all about the judgment day. This one could just be the the Chad Gable coronation uh, into a champion. I mean, I could see that happening. Yeah, because you're not doing anything with Roman Reigns. Um, they're probably not going to strip the titles off the Judgment Day this quick. No. You know, Rhea's not giving up her belt for a minute. No, and there's like, who else? Who is challenging for the U.S. title right now? Like... I don't know. The Judgment Day really doesn't, you know, they had that face off with the Street Profits. That that could go somewhere. But like you said, you're probably not going to move the titles off them that quickly. So this is the next story that's had the longest or, or, or the longest amount of time dedicated to it that needs to find some kind of resolution. This could be it. Because I don't I don't see them going and running Shinsuke and Seth back at the next one. I think they will, but I don't know if they'll. But not at. Fast lane or whatever they're calling it, right? I th- I think that'll still be the main event at Fast Lane, but I'm not necessarily so sure that Shinsuke and Shinsuke might beat Seth at Fast Lane. I don't know, but I don't think that that's the thing that we'll come out talking about. What we'll talk about is the match between Gunther and Chad Gable, where they didn't they didn't have to worry about commercial breaks. <laughs> they just did it at a pay per view. They went 28 minutes. They put on a classic. They beat the shit out of each other. And at the end damn Chad Gable brings his family in and everybody's crying and the streamers are coming down fucking and American the Olympian up there. and there you go and it's a feel good moment for everybody America yeah. yeah and you could play it Gunther can Gunther can eat a loss and you can easily make it to where like Giovanna Risby is the reason he he fucks up and loses did you say Giovanna who would be seen like that Giovanni no what's his fucking name <laughs> it's Giovanni something I just fucking lost it is Giovanni is it not Ripsy? It might be, but like there was, there was, what's the kid's name? He was an actor in the late nineties, early, early two thousands, Giovanni Ribisi. He was in a bunch of shit and he was really good and he just disappeared. Yeah, man. That's the nineties for you. (laughs) Whoever Giovanni, whatever his last name is, the bald headed one. Yeah. That guy, the least talented of the group. The one with the the bald head is what I think Kevin Owens. Yeah. That guy, that guy can be the reason he fucks. They fuck up and lose. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I, I think, uh, I think we can end on that note unless you got anything else that we didn't cover for this week. No, I mean, this week was, we'll do five minutes right here. College football. Yeah, that's right. Listen, 
I am a notorious shit stirrer. Okay. I love it. Listen, I love to see chaos. I, for some reason, when we were working in the same place, I thought, I, for, I thought you were just Bama fan. And then that last year or so I was there, you're like, no, fuck it, man. I want chaos. I want everybody to lose. I want everybody. And I want everybody to go into this motherfucker, like even kill. Yeah. You're like, blow it up. Blow it all up. And damn, Quinn Ewers walked into Tuscaloosa Saturday night. Beat the shit. Just fucking unzipped his pants. <laughs> threw it up on the table and was like, this is it. Dynasty's dead. Here we go. It's over. That's what he did right I there. I killed it. I mean, it, it, the dynasty, the, the death of the Alabama dynasty has probably been exaggerated these past, I don't know, five years or whatever, you know. Every time Alabama loses two games, fans freak the hell out, right? This time, though, feels different. Feels a lot different. You got Colorado coming on strong. I'm not saying Colorado could beat Alabama, but I'm just saying, like, the landscape of college football is changing with the NIL and all the money that these schools the can offer portal, these kids. Yeah. The transfer portal. Transfer. Like, it's just different, man, dog. Yeah, you know... <laughs> My cousin, uh, co- uh, host of the Stare Down podcast on the Alabama uh, Take Network, Mallory Chandler, texted me Sunday and was like, are you okay? And I said, like, yeah, I'm fine. I don't take this shit like I used to. Like, used to, this shit would have ruined my entire week. And my wife even Saturday night was like, do I need to, like, leave for a little while? Are you good? And I was like, baby, I'm, I went in for four drinks tonight instead of my three on Saturday. I was like, I'm good. Like, I quit letting this shit affect my whole mood several years ago, right? Like, it's just going to happen. But also, on the one other hand, Bama plays fucking angry after they take an L. So, like, they're going to beat the fuck out of their next several opponents. I have zero doubt. But I also went into this season with super low expectations. I think that... I, this is going to sound crazy. I think Bama's got four losses this year. I mean, I... Cool. I, I think last year... People, I heard some idiotic Alabama fans be like, Bryce Young's overrated. He never won a national championship. If you give Bryce Young the damn receivers and offensive line and running backs that uh, old Tua had when he was in school, fucking Al- every game in Alabama would have been over at halftime. Yeah. And they yeah. don't have... Tua a- had goddamn Devontae and uh, Waddle. He had all these... And then fucking running backs. Yeah. I could tell you one Alabama running back. Previous years, I could name you four deep that they could lean on. And you, they don't. I mean, Jackson Milrow, is that his name? Jalen. Jalen Milrow. He's decent. Good. He looks shaky as shit. He's not, but they don't, because they don't have the top tier quarterback. The Bryce Youngs and the Tua's and the Mac Joneses are not there no more. This dude's not an NFL quarterback. And they don't have shutdown. I mean, they got a, they got a good front and middle. But their corners are not well. That's it, top tier like they have. Every been. SEC school is going to be dominant across the defensive line, especially and linebackers. They're going to be fast. That's just how that's how the South is made, baby. We <laughs> big and fast down here. That's what we do. But like, they don't have the quarterbacks. I don't think they do. And like I talked about this NIL thing, for as much as people want to bitch about it, it's changed the landscape of college football. For I think for the better. Because you cannot convince me that fucking Alabama wasn't paying these players. Yeah, let, let these kids get their money, man. They, yeah. I, there was this thing on TV the other day talking about Bryce when he was at Bama was secretly doing like DoorDash and shit, but for extra money before NIL was a thing. And he was like, you know, taking... Uh, I, think, I think that was before Bryce Young was actually Bryce, you know. Yeah. Like, that was like his freshman year. His freshman year, but still. He wasn't doing that shit last season. Yeah, but still. Still, yeah. Um. Did you? So I guess you saw it, right? I saw it, yeah. And I was a little... You know, like, I was did DoorDash when I was in Alabama. I was like, yeah, you need to clarify the time frame about when, when you, you was did that, my string. man. When you were Yeah, <laughs> when you was sitting on a bench not playing. Yeah. Don't think you were DoorDashing last year, but... Whatever. Yeah, you know what... <sighs> At this point, this is what I texted Mallory. Uh, y'all listen to the Stare Down podcast. Um, she's already had, a, like, she's six episodes in at this point. Several great episodes already. Uh, hardcore Ole Miss fan, for what it's worth. Um, like, I've seen them win so many championships at this point in the last several years. Like, 
I'm kind of like you. Like I, I've been rooting for Ole Miss. I like watching Lane Kiffin coach now. Yeah, I wouldn't have said that ten years ago, but like he shakes it up. I went out of my way to be home at eleven o'clock Saturday morning to watch Colorado. Yeah, got off to a slow start, but they got a big win over Nebraska. You know, it's fun. If it that's the shit that makes college football fun, right? Yeah, and also. To the Alabama fans who left the stadium early Saturday, you ungrateful little pieces of shit. You stay in that stadium, take your ass whooping like a man, okay? You've dominated college football for over a decade at this point. Fucking sit there in the stands and lose like every other team has had to do. These are kids you're supposed to be there supporting. Yes. So sit there. Quit leaving. Yeah. But Nick Saban's going to retire at the end of the year and all hell's going to break loose. So if you thought shit's bad for Alabama now, you just wait. Look, I told a friend of mine seven, eight years ago, he was like, oh, there's rumors, you know, Saban's going to Texas. Whenever that was, it might have been longer than that at this fucking point. I was like, you know what? It's been a good run. It's been fun. And we won a few championships after that. Yeah. Appreciate you. Respect, like I. Wh- what else do you want me to say? It's been cool, but you're a sensible Alabama fan. There's some out there. I, I lived through the dark insane. days. I'm, I'm, I'm good, man. We've had our run. Yeah, but but like, this is just how this is how sports is just supposed to go. You're not supposed to stay on top for forever. You know, uh, college football has been able to do it. Just because they've had, you know, people have been able to game the system or, you know, you have boosters who slide some money under the table. Yeah, if you don't think this people have been getting paid in college football, you're just an idiot. I mean, they've yeah. been getting paid for a while. You it's just out in the open now. Head too far on so, the stand. So, um, yeah, college football has always been big business and now the players get a chunk of it. And now because of that, you have a team like Colorado who can have fucking 38 transfers and – However many new 17 new starters and completely remake their I'm here college for football it. team. I'm here for it. I'm here for it. I'm here for the USC and Caleb Williams. I'm here for all these guys. I just want to see – I'm here for Clemson fucking Dabo Sweeney just shit in the bed because he's got a bunch of – you know, not to be – you know, he got a bunch of damn white dudes out there like it's a fucking <laughs> 2A Christian Academy. It's like, damn, bro. He, he's coaching at BYU. Yeah, my man. Hey, you, you got to get gotta get some players in here, my man. Uh, so, yeah, I'm all for the chaos of college football. Let it keep going. So, I hope nobody's undefeated. That, that's what I'm talking about. There's, like, just give me some chaos. I'm yeah. with you at this point. Just give me some chaos. Let every team have, get two L's. And Brian Kelly should be in prison. Let's never forget that. Yeah, never forget he killed a kid. He killed a kid. So uh, every single LSU loss, that is the one team where I'm like, I get ex- I get giddy when Alabama loses. I get fucking ecstatic when Brian Kelly loses. <laughs> I think there's not a bigger piece of shit on this earth than that man right there. Let's talk about Colorado. Is it is there a primetime game this weekend? Yeah, Colorado State. Shit. I'm going to be on the beach. Um but it's fine. They're gonna wear their ass out. Yeah, this shit's gonna be over. Um, so if we're a little light on content next week, forgive us because Thursday afternoon, my lovely wife and I are leaving to go to the beach until Sunday afternoon. Um, and I'm probably gonna take an iPad to keep up with a game or two. I probably won't watch SmackDown Friday night. Probably won't watch Collision on Saturday. Um, I might look at some of it if I'm sipping on a cocktail on the balcony of our condo on Saturday night. Yeah, I mean, you, there's so much wrestling known now. You can't you can't consume it all. Right. Oh, that's why we don't talk about NXT. Yeah. Like, I see the highlights. Like, I yeah. saw the Braun Breaker spot. I thought it was cool. I mean, I immediately knew how they did it. All the people are like, oh, you really smart? No, he no. I mean, you could tell instantly how they shot it and yeah. what, how they did it on purpose. But like, we don't watch NXT for that reason. It's just yeah. literally too much wrestling to keep up with. I have zero interest in watching Alabama beat the shit out of whichever small Florida college they're playing Saturday. Yeah. Um, I would probably keep an eye on Colorado just for the shit of it, um, which I may do Saturday night on yeah. the balcony of my condo with a cocktail in my hand. Um 
Yeah. We'll see. Yeah, yeah it's uh, college football is fucked up and fun, and I'm here for the chaos. I need some kind of uh, some kind of chaos in my life, and to to be gleeful in other people's misery because we're Titans fans, so it looks like a bleak season Just, for us. But it's so long as you're not that fucking Auburn guy who doesn't delight in his team's wins, but his fucking rivals losses. Those are the fucking worst. I love it, bro. Take it wherever you can get it. Take your joy <laughs> no, wherever you can get it in this you, world. Fuck you, Napoleon. <laughs> get the fuck out of here with that shit. That's the worst shit in the world. Oh, oh there's my dog. There he is. All right. Well, I that's, guess that's going to do it. That's for time us. to wrap it up. He's saying, get the hell out. Yep. We're at an hour <laughs> and uh, 16 seconds. So that's going to do it. Be sure to check us out on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Alabama Slam Pod. Our TikTok is popping off these days. Um, we're putting up little selects from each week and uh, video samples and, um, you know, getting a lot of reaction over there. And that's probably where we get the most feedback, which is a little insane at this point. Yeah, fuck Twitter, fuck Facebook. Yeah. TikTok's works out. And we're on Facebook. Well, we get zero interaction on Facebook. So um, be sure to follow our network uh, at the Alabama Take on basically all social media, the Alabama Take dot com. We've got uh, several podcasts going on now. As I mentioned earlier, my cousin Mallory uh, at the Stare Down Podcast with sports. Um, since we just talked about sports for the last 10 minutes of our show, my lovely wife, Jamie, has um, a monthly book podcast with her co-host, Jennifer Kimbrew. Uh, we have Taking It Down, which is a weekly podcast with Blaine, Blaine Duncan and his cohorts, uh, all things pop culture, TV, movies, etc., uh, this song sucks. Just finished up their last season, our newest season, I believe. And then there's taken on sports with TD Wood and his co-host, uh, weekly sports podcast. It's weekly at this point. Um, I believe they were doing bi-weekly. Um, but now that it's football season, we got to talk about football. Um, so we got lots of football activity happening with the Alabama take, uh, network. And then, um, we are a star war with me and some of my best friends, Corey and Jim, we have a, a Star Wars podcast that we put out whenever we can. Uh, we're called We Are a Star War, and we've been putting some out fairly con- uh, fairly consecutively recently. Uh, we rec- recorded a bunch at once, and um, we've kind of backstocked some. So be on the lookout for those, and uh, just please follow us on social media and like and review us on Apple Podcasts. Um, that supposedly helps us. Um, get boosted in the ratings and all that bullshit. And we're pretty popular apparently on TikTok or not TikTok, uh, but yes, TikTok, but YouTube as well. Um, if you search Alabama Slam, we come up as part of the Alabama Take Network on YouTube. Um, but yeah, um, check back next week. Um, I'll try to watch as much wrestling as I can in the next week, and uh, we will definitely record an episode when I get back. Later, guys. Thanks. Thanks.